So my introduction will be very brief. Um, so this will be about quantum information theory. And as you may know, quantum information theory is now a fairly fashionable subject. There's a, there's a very big uh, funding program by the European community called a flagship initiative for quantum information technologies. And uh, if you have those people who build the hardware for quantum information technologies, somebody has to think about the software. And actually, as you will see, the field actually has been theory-driven. That is, you have to understand the theory first before you can even say what the interesting things are. Right? So, the, one of the early slogans in quantum information theory was that we are the people that turn paradoxes into products. Right? So, um, quantum mechanics had this, this, uh, this reputation of being difficult to understand, full of paradoxes, cats and dogs and uh, all kinds of strange things that presumably you could under couldn't understand very well. And then, um, uh, so, or as, as, as uh, Charlie Bennett used to put it, entanglement used to be a way to subtly uh, humiliate the, propo uh, the opponents of quantum mechanics. So you could, you could annoy people by bringing up things about, quantum, uh, about entanglement. So this is the paradoxical aspect. But then suddenly entanglement becomes a resource. And you learn that you can do certain things with that that you hadn't thought about before. And, and, and of course, we are going. To, we are hopefully going to see some products in the near future uh, that do interesting things using these aspects. So, um, so if the, if if quantum mechanics is a bit paradoxical, then it is especially important that you have a way to uh, solidify your intuitions. Right? So the, the paradoxical just means that some of the, your everyday intuitions uh, will fail when you apply them to the quantum world. So if you want to make a product out of this, you will better have a way to decide what you can do and what you cannot do. And the way to decide that is actually to rely on the formalism. So, so necessarily quantum information theory is fairly mathematical. You need the structure um, to, to make sure what you can do, what you cannot do, what are the possibilities, and so on. And um, so this was actually recognized in this whole field of quantum information theory early on. Um, so in, in most of physics, uh, that is as represented, let's say, by physical review letters, if you write theorem, your paper is going to be rejected. That's the rough rule of thumb. Right? But in the quantum information community this was actually different because people, all, everybody in the field recognized that it's necessary to, to have a good mathematical understanding, good the theoretical background, good formal apparatus that would allow you to decide what you can do and what you can't. Right? So therefore um, quantum information theory uh, has, has one abstract part. Uh, so there are two kinds of quantum information theory that you can distinguish. So there is what I call abstract quantum information theory and there's a more concrete uh, version of the theory. And this is analogous to what you have in classical information theory. In classical information theory um, there's one part that is abstract classical information theory. For, so for a classical information theorist like Claude Shannon a bit is a bit, and it doesn't matter how you represent it physically. And um, on that level, there are many things that you can there are many things that you can discuss on that level, you, and uh, actually solutions that you can find for coding quantum error cor uh, not quantum just error correction and stuff. So many things you can understand on this abstract level. And the power of this abstract approach is that it applies to all the possible realizations. And similarly, on the, on the quantum information theory, you have this abstract quantum information theory that, uh, for which all qubits are the same, if you want. Huh? So everything, every, uh, all you want to know about the system is the Hilbert space, or actually the dimension of the Hilbert space. 
and, um, and you can say a lot about possible processing, uh, ways to process these, these systems and, and use them for information theoretical purposes or for computing or whatnot. So um, you have this abstract side and then of course there is a part of the theory that deals with the concrete realizations that you have. That this is more the technology oriented or experimentally oriented theory. So um, in, the, in, the, in the case of quantum information, the very often this is uh, quantum optics are um, actually increasingly solid state theory and superconductors um, and stuff like that. Right? So, uh, we will deal here mostly with this abstract quantum information theory, um, and that's that's so. So, if you want, the title should be changed to abstract quantum information theory. But I didn't want to frighten anybody. What it means is that these this, these are the general principles that are useful in any of these applications. Okay, so much for an introduction. Are there questions from your side? That was a short introduction. Now let's um, come to part one, which I call So, um, and maybe the first section of that would be Introduce some of the basic concepts that you probably know from from your quantum mechanics lecture. Maybe not speaking of channels, but states and observables should definitely have been there. And so this is partly just to re uh, to recap uh, the, the quantum mechanics and the the basic. I'm not sure I'll stick to three levels of. Uh, <laughs> Sectioning. Um, so, so look at. Let's look at a simple quantum experiment. And this gives me the opportunity to. So these boxes, uh, actually, I've uh, come from my. I, I, I learned this this way of representing things from my thesis advisor Günther Ludwig. So we call them Ludwig boxes. Right? And um, so the idea is that you can split every quantum mechanical experiment into two basic parts. A preparation and a measurement. And the mathematical objects um, that are associated with this would be states and observables. And so, so you have some way to prepare your system and some way to measure on it. And actually, you, this, is, this is what the theory basically is talking about. And it's actually not talking about the system itself in some way. Right? So uh, here is uh, a cloud. So, so this is system is something that passes from preparation to measurement. And you don't really have a description. You don't start from a description of the system as such. But you start from saying what happens in such experiments. So. Um, so this has a long tradition. If you want, you can cite the, one of the first works on quantum, me quantum mechanics, Heisenberg's paper from 25, where, um, where he emphasizes that you want to look at observable quantities. Uh, from 
the whole period there. Um, um, uh, need classical language. what you've done in your experiment. That basically means that you have a description of your apparatuses, uh, but you don't talk directly about the system. And Ludwig uh, in the 60s, late 60s, would maximize this view. So he explained how to understand all of quantum mechanics as a theory of preparation and measurement. Um, and uh, um, quantum information would be uh, very much based on this picture. So, um, so preparation and measurement is uh, sending and receiving. This is just a fancy way of talking about the same kind of experiment, where um, you think of this as, a, as, as some device that sends information, and the, the measurement is a way to, to read the information. Right? And you could say this, this whole program of Ludwig, you could, you, you could explain as trying to learn about quantum systems by seeing what I can write on them. Right? So quantum systems like electrons and stuff, you, you learn about those in, in, by trying to put information on them in a reliable way that you can actually read out again afterwards. And the different, different preparations, different ways of writing and reading, this is what the theory is about. And it tells you what the options are for reading and writing. And uh, in that sense, it's very much like sending and receiving. So from the outset in some way, so, so actually, this, this is how I learned quantum mechanics, basically. Um, and you don't, you don't try to find a good language of directly describing the system, but you talk about what you can do with the system. So this is the op operational approach. Let's say quantum information and, uh, and operational approach. That would always emphasize what the possible actions are and what I see when I do certain things over trying to directly looking into the, I mean, directly describing the, the systems. Okay, so, um, I've, I've written some letters here. So the mathematical formalism now directly sits on top of this picture and tells you how to describe the various parts of this picture. And um, so the states here are represented by certain kinds of objects. So, um, so this starts by associating with every system type a Hilbert space. Typical letter and font is H, calligraphic H, um, and uh, so the states in this picture are a description of the preparation of the system, but describing what I actually uh, set up, I mean my, my macroscopic device like, um, like the LHC, that's a nice preparation preparation device. It's not very compact, but it's, it's, this is just what it does. It produces particles, right? Uh, or something much less fancy. So the, the full macroscopic description of that would be quite a lot. And would... Um, so the states actually... Uh, would be a description 
description of the preparation. In, uh, in all features, which I can read afterwards, right? which uh, make a difference for subsequent measurements. So, if I get the same probabilities on, with arbitrary measurements for two different preparations, they are described by the same state. So this is an equivalence class with respect to statistical indistinguishability and mathematically, uh, so given by density operators. So this is uh, rho would be an operator, a linear operator on that Hilbert space, uh, which is positive and has trace one. Now, many of these things we come back to and look at in much greater detail. For example, the positivity will be my next chapter, so we'll talk about positivity in depth. So if you're not quite sure now what that means at the moment, just wait a moment, we'll come to that today. Um, so the observables has, that has a similar description. So I identify two measuring devices. If they give me the same probabilities for arbitrary preparation, uh, so again this allows me to uh, associate it directly with that. Um, some mathematical objects. So um, an observer, of course, or a measuring device, at, at the end of every measurement act, you of course you get some result. Right? Now, it doesn't matter whether this is a number or not. It could be uh, your alphabet or your, your set of possible outcomes, as we say, it could be the set uh, banana, the number five, and... Uh, I don't know what, right? It doesn't, doesn't really matter what it is. These are labels. These are labels for different things that can occur on your device. And these labels are conventional, right? You could use numbers, that's very often done, but you could also use some other things. Right? Whatever, whatever you use as labels doesn't matter. So, so let's say X is your outcome set. Um, uh, so, um, Outcome set. And for the moment, let's think of that as discrete. And then for every A, um, the observable is given by an operator which is positive uh, for every outcome. And uh, this has the property that the sum over all outcomes is the identity operator. And uh, then the trace of rho fa is the probability. Or outcome a. Of course, given the preparation uh, described by rho and given the measurement described by this family of operators, which I call an observer. Now, this might not be completely identical <coughs> with what you heard in your quantum mechanics course, but we'll discuss these differences. Um, typically, you take a projection uh, operator here for a yes-no <coughs> measurement, namely, is the result A or not? For that, you typically, uh, most quantum mechanics textbooks ask you to take a projection there, but we don't actually need that, and this is why we, don't, we are not going to assume that. Okay, so... Um, I think I'll erase now and, and um, give you some of the notation for Hilbert space that, that fixes the language, the mathematical language that we're going to use. Right? 
Okay, so um, Be just to leave this thing a little bit less vague. So, actually, Hilbert space, why is it called Hilbert space? Does anybody know? Well, Hilbert sort of used them uh, some, some time before quantum mechanics started for actually for solving integral equations or for theory of integral equations. But the main reason why we, why we call that Hilbert space is because he gave a quantum mechanics lecture in 1926-27. So this is when the theory was very, very young, right? basically in nappies. And um, so doing that as a mathematician in Göttingen was kind of a bold act. Right? <laughs> um, so the, the, the physicists were actually still struggling with basic interpretation, and many things were quite unclear, as you can see from Heisenberg's paper from 1927, for example, um, that he, he doesn't really, uh, how should I say, I mean, he, he's not in full command of the formalism, right? which is actually a lot to, would, would be a lot to expect. So, but Hilbert gives a lecture about this, and um, he had two assistants. One was uh, a guy named Nord, Nordheim, I think. I don't know what became of that guy. But the other guy was uh, John von Neumann, young Hungarian mathematician. And while this lecture progressed, von Neumann created all the mathematics for uh, that we now use. Right? So this is this is, and this must be must be a fantastic must have been a fantastic lecture. I don't know how much of it was actually in the lecture. Uh, actually, the first part of the lecture was about what, what was then called old quantum mechanics. This was like Bohr atom and Bohr Sommerfeld quantization and all these things that didn't work. Right? <laughs> and uh, Hilbert had given an earlier lecture about that, some, some, some years before that. And um, so he basically repeated most of this older lecture, and then there was a part new quantum mechanics, and uh, that had all the innovations of uh, Heisenberg, Schrödinger, and these guys, and as regards mathematics, all the innovations by John von Neumann. Uh, von Neumann wrote a couple of papers about this in Göttinger Mathematische Annalen, which means that no physicist ever read it. <laughs> um, and, uh, but he was actually quite well known uh, for that later on. Uh, first of all, the, the, the better physicists, or well, some, some of the physicists did, did take notice a little bit, uh, but especially after he wrote a book about it. So this was in 1932, and this book by von Neumann was, was uh, a classic. So many, many physicists 
studied the formalism from that book. Right? But he, von Neumann actually did these things right in the, in the first years of quantum mechanics, so I would think we definitely must, must count him a founding father of quantum mechanics. So, what are our not notations? So, Hilbert space uh, is a vector space over C. Actually, one of my students uh, uh, actually wrote a master thesis way be while there was still a possibility for diploma. And his, the co advisor was a mathematician, and in his grading of the thesis, he complained that this guy was writing Hilbert space without saying that it was a Hilbert space over C. <laughs> it could have been one over the reals, right? So, um, um, actually, we don't usually, this is, uh, we don't usually say that anymore. Definitely, it's always the complex field. Um, with scalar product. So this is a function of h plus h c. So we, I write scalar products like this with uh, Langle and Wrangle in tech. And uh, so this is a, for any two vectors in the Hilbert space, this is a complex number. And uh, here is uh, an important convention. Um, so this is a bilinear uh, function, or a sesquilinear function, as they say. Sesquilinear means one and a half linear. So it's not quite bilinear. It's somewhere between linear and bilinear. Um, and what, what is meant by that is that you have this rule for extracting factors. Um, but if you have... Uh, so we extract the, the, uh, the complex factor. So lambda is in C. This is the complex conjugate. So, with this board, you can immediately identify my, my, myself as a physicist, because mathematicians uh, take the factor out, complex, the complex conjugate out of the second factor and extract the factor linearly from the first factor. This is a convention. It really doesn't make any difference. But uh, the universal convention in mathematics is exactly opposite from the modern physics. And uh, I'm writing complex conjugate not because I assume that you don't know what a complex conjugate is, but to fix my notation for that, because some people write a dagger for that. Right? <coughs> so uh, for me, over bar is complex conjugate. And of course you have these properties that that this is uh, always not negative and vanishes exactly when phi is a zero vector. And uh, this defines a norm and the Hilbert space is supposed to be complete. This, this is abstract Hilbert space. Uh, we'll come to the concrete spaces in a minute. Um, this is all you have to know about Hilbert space in some sense. Now, um, for operators, uh, whenever I say operator, they will be linear. Um, so for me, linearity is part of same operator, and then, um, then A is bounded, so it would say an operator A that would be mapped from H to H, bounded, If you have this estimate for the image of A, where this is the co some constant, so this is a, so this is called the norm of A, but this is the best constant in this inequality is called the norm. 
And uh, my notation for that would be, for, for A being bounded, would be B of H for the bounded operators. Um, okay. I have a list of notations that I want to tell you. Now, yes, when uh, for A in B of H, you find a star again. My main reason for writing this on the board is that you've probably seen dagger or plus or some other kind of symbol there. So for me, the adjoint is star. Uh, by this equation, so if you plot, apply a star to any vector, I can tell you the scalar product with any other upper, uh, vector by this equation. So this is also called the Hermitian conjugate. And again, uh, some people write a dagger for that. Actually, if you want to write in the physical review or physical review, review letters, you're supposed to write a dagger, otherwise they take this for a complex conjugate. So, there the are various conventions around, this is why I'm writing this now. Um, what else? Um, those are the adjoints. Now, um, Now, a basis a basis a basis of H is um, a labeled list of vectors. Now, basis can be, mean various things, and uh, so I'll always use this as orthonormal basis, such that the scalar product is 1 when, uh, so the norm of each of these vectors is 1, and they are orthogonal. So this is orthonormal, and uh, the linear hull of this of the set of, uh, of this set uh, is a whole Hilbert space, i.e. Uh, phi as a vector phi for all phi. You can write this equation. Um, you expand in this basis. That's the term for that. So that will be a sum of these vectors with appropriate linear, co uh, linear factors here, and the factors are e mu phi. And this sum converges in norm. Right, so this, this clearly says that every vector in the, in the space can be approximated by linear combinations of the basis vector. And that's, that's part of the definition of the basis, right? Um, shorthand for that. Is writing cats. Now, let me, let me dwell on that a little bit. You've seen bras and cats in your lecture, probably, right? Uh, so, so if you want to do this in a mathematically nice way, you, you, you should think of um, this notation. 
as a, as a map from the complex numbers to the Hilbert space. Uh, so this is this is an operator. Now the complex numbers are also a Hilbert space, right? uh, because uh, the scalar product would just be the complex conjugate times the other vector, right? and uh, and the this acts on this operator by just taking the corresponding multiple of this vector. Can you? It's not, this, this, we'll have many equations like that where I define an operator by saying what it does, right? So, so this is supposed to be an operator on the complex number. So I have to tell you what does it do to a complex number. And here's what it does. It takes the corresponding multiple uh, that will then be a Hilbert space vector because phi is in the Hilbert space. Right? Now, um, let us compute the adjoint of this operator. So, um, what is that? Now, the adjoint of an operator between two Hilbert spaces will go, go in the opposite direction. It will be an operator from H to C. And uh, let's see what it does. So, apply that to some vector psi. Now, the, the definition of the adjoint So the, 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 these two Hilbert spaces don't have to be the same, right? So if I if I look at this, uh, this will be um, in the in a scalar product in H two, and this will be a scalar product in H one. Is that right? Uh, no. Only one way to get it wrong. Then. Okay, so phi here would be a vector in H2, um, and the psi would be in H1. Now this takes you into the other Hilbert space, into H2, and then you can form the scalar product. And H star does the opposite thing, so phi was in H2, as we've learned here, so it takes you back from H2 to H1. So the, just this equation tells you that the arrows will be reversed for the adjoint. When you go from H1 to H2, you do the opposite for the adjoint. Now, that's, that's what happens here, right? So the two Hilbert spaces are the complex numbers and whatever your Hilbert space was. So this will go in the opposite direction, and in order to compute that, we have to take the definition. Uh, ah, uh, we'll go to C. Right? So I take the the, the scalar product with an element of C, which is just a complex number. Huh? So this will, this will be in C, and this will be in H. Uh, I think I need this joke, because that is the name of the operator. The name of the op operator is ket phi. Now, what does it do? We have to apply this ket phi operator on the other side of the scalar product. But this has a definition. So this is just z times phi. And this is uh, just z bar phi epsilon. Uh, oops. Just a comma. Uh, yeah, I'll. Ah. Let, me, let me correct this. Uh, I use this synonymously. The vertical bar there can be long. I just declare this now, so I don't have to... I try to be consistent here and would only have done this afterwards, after my explanation. But, uh, okay, so I can do it like this. Um, so, so this whole thing is supposed to be in C. 
And the scalar product in C is just take the complex conjugate of the first number and multiply it with the second. So what we can read from this, because this is true for any z, for example, 1, we read that phi star applied to the vector psi is just the complex number, which is the scalar product of the two. Now, this, this, is, this is very suggestive, because um, so this, this vector is on that side. It's also linear in that. And it's conjugate linear in that, so this is very much like the scalar product. So we just define that as that. So the adjoint of this ket operator that takes you from C to H is a bra operator. And uh, if you multiply these two, you could just put them together like this. Now, literally, if you take two strokes here, you have one operator take, that takes you from C to H and another one that takes you back to C. So a linear operator from the complex numbers to the complex numbers is nothing but multiplication by a factor. And this factor is just a scalar product. So, so this, this is the origin of this usage that your cats and bras will be, if, if you want to think of them mathematically, think of them as operators from the complex numbers to the Hilbert space all back. And uh, you identify um, a map from the complex numbers to itself by the number it multiplies with. Right? And this, this is the, the bra cat notation, basically. Now, um, I've introduced a further level of this by saying that if, if, if we have the basis vector, we just write the label of the basis vector, and that's good enough. Now, the reason to do that is that we want to have a compact notation that makes you, that allows fast computations of various things. So let's, let's see that in action. Okay, so um, this leads us to matrix elements. So given, let's say we are given a basis. So then these basis cats will just be abbreviated new, sort of if if space is clear from context. Now we have this formula that, that I wrote before, namely uh, some new Comes that uh, well. Let, let me first rewrite this, right? So so they, so that they sorry, I should write it like this. So this is just a scalar product, right? With the abbreviation that e nu is short to nu. Whenever I do that, I'll certainly write a vertical bar because otherwise I get confused. So, um, so this is just this is this factor, and this is the vector. Right? So, 
You could further abbreviate that to saying 1 is the sum of these operators. Now, these operators that have a cat and then a bra, uh, did I, I, I mentioned the term bra, right? Bras for the other, the other guys. So this, these, these cat bra operators, math, math, mathematicians would call that a rank 1 operator, because it, it factorizes like this, it takes a linear functional and then multiplies it with a the, with the vector. Um, and um, okay, so this this is a shorthand for the property of the basis that um, that says that uh, that every vector can be expanded. Now, working with matrix elements, so these are so the the uh, so the words here are these are the components. whenever you want to do linear algebra uh, in your Hilbert space, you would introduce a basis and everything, every vector becomes a list of components and every, uh, every operator becomes an array of components. And this is, this is the array, it has two indices and uh, that gives you a matrix. Now, um, just as an example of how to compute here, Let's look at the matrix elements of an operator product. An operator, the product of an operator, of course, is defined by first applying one operator and then the other operator. Now, this you could write as a one b mu and use this equation for uh, for one. But now, of course, I have to write. This is a dummy index, and I can choose this in whatever way. So, um, and I have to because otherwise I overload this, the, uh, I mean I, I would redefine what this, this vector does. Right? So I need, I need to use a dummy index that I haven't used before. So this is mu uh, kappa So if you would like, want to write this as a mu kappa and this as b, b kappa mu, you recognize the familiar matrix product where indices that are next to each other are summed over and that gives you a b uh, sum over. So, so the, the usual matrix product just comes out of this by expanding everything inside into components. Um, what else do we need? I, I guess that's good enough for that part. Ah, yes, the trace. Um, I think I
Okay. Uh, the trace. So an operator is called trace class. Trace class. And our notation for that will be this T of H. Now B of H is the place where all the observables are going to live. And T of H, the trace class, is where all the states are going to live, all the density operators. So, uh, if the following sum, now I do write the basis for this special location. So I can take this, these diagonal matrix elements of an operator. Uh, diagonal means that here the first index and the second index is the same. Now, this, this gives me a, a usually infinite list of numbers. And the condition for the operator to be trace class is that this uh, sum that, you, that is written there converges absolutely for every basis. and is independent of the basis. So, so you could say that um, the traces that the traces are going to be the sum. So I write TR of A, then this number that you get in any basis is called Now, this, this is the definition that you know from linear algebra of the trace of an operator on any basis. And I'm, I'm just taking that definition and saying now, well, we actually have a possibly infinite sum here. And the condition for the good operators for which this makes sense are those operators for which this sum converges absolutely, that is, independent of the ordering. Um, and also, you always get the same number. Both conditions are needed. Right? Um, and so, in particular, if an operator is positive, this is uh, if it converges in one basis, it will converge in every basis. This is this makes it a bit easier. Uh, so, for density operators, you just need to check this in one basis. Right? And uh, okay, so so this was needed. So when when a a is a bounded operator and rho is a trace class operator, then it follows that rho times A is a trace class operator. This, so this is, mathematicians say that the trace class is an ideal of the bounded operators. That is, if, if, uh, if you multiply anything with the trace class operator, it becomes a trace class operator. Okay? Um, <coughs> which is necessary for uh, For expressions like this, uh, it's defined. And they appear all the time as expectation values. Okay, so um, that was my notation for the trace. So far, uh, just, just as an intermediate check, how much of what I said uh, is unknown to you? Uh, let's say. Is there more than 50% unknown to anybody here? More than 10% uh, unknown? So it's all, it's all been there. It, it, it has all been there, right? So actually, the, the question I should usually ask is, um, do you know about this? Option A. B, have you heard about this? C, do you think you should have heard about this? <laughs> And finally, never heard of that, right? So, so these are so somewhere along that scale. This is mostly well-known material, and I'm mostly I'm writing it on the board mostly to just remind you. Yeah? So, um, so we had a concrete Hilbert spaces. No, we didn't have that yet.
So what I said so far, I would call an abstract Hilbert space. This, this just gives you the basic structures of the Hilbert space. This is the stuff that you have to have in order to call something in Hilbert space. But then there, very often the Hilbert space that you actually use has more structure to it. Right? So these would be things that are typically written like that. So this is, uh, um, so this is a measure. Uh, now most of you probably didn't have a course in measure theory, correct? Or do you, would you be comfort, uh, comfortable with measures in general? Not complete course, but I think in, for every physicist who attends uh, Mathematics for Physica, there is a introduction to measure and theory. And I think uh, there, yeah. a good one. Okay, okay, good. So uh, I'll, I'll mostly use this without too much comment. But uh, when, when things get subtle, of course, I'll make some remarks. So, so this is, uh, so here x uh, is a space with measure, with a measure. Mu, and the space means that you have a sigma algebra of sets on which you, in this case, on which the measure can even be defined. Right? So uh, if if n is measurable, which is a certain subset of the, I mean some some of the sets in x are measurable, then we write mu of m is the measure, right? Is the measure. And whenever I have that, I can write uh, expressions like this. And that's something that, so this is the integral with respect to a scalar function, or not necessarily scalar. This gives you a linear functional, right? So when f, uh, a measurable function and this this would typically then uh, be an expression that we later will see as an expectation value and so this is a linear functional I use this notation with the two kind of different kinds of bracket. This is the set function, so the round brackets of mu, they want a set, a subset of x. For example, a very small subset, dx. And the square bracket want a function on the space. So, so this, this is this, this linear, linear function. Right? And they're basically the same object. This is why I want to use the same letter for both and distinguish them only in the notation for the, uh, for the parentheses here, right? So, um, there, and, and to see how, have, how they're related is that um, if f is a linear combination, 1 to uh, n, uh, let's say, a i times a characteristic function of a measurable set, so we have m i are mutually disjoint measurable sets, and the union of the mi are the whole space. Right? So we have a partition of our set into sub measurable subsets ma, and then each of these has a measure. Right? And then, so then mu of f is just defined to be the sum, this is supposed to be a linear functional, right? So you, I can pull that out, and the integral over such a characteristic function, did I uh, define that thing? Chi m um, of x is a function which is 1 when x is in m, and 0 that's not the case. Right? So this is a step function which is 0 outside m and 1 exactly on m, and then This is the definition of the integral. I multiply the volume of each 
of each step by this, the height of the step, which is this. So this is a general step function. And integration of step functions is defined like that. So you see from this, when you, take, when you just plug in one of these indicator functions, then you get the set function from the linear functional back. And conversely, if you know the, the set function, that is the value of the measures of the various sets in X, then you can get the linear function. Now this is not all of measure theory, but almost all of measure theory, because all that is missing here is some approximation steps. Okay, so, um, so these would be concrete level spaces. And I have, now I have half a bar to describe the spectral theorem. Right? Um, ah, yeah, I should give one example. One example. Um, X is some set, and uh, mu is the counting measure. Which is defined by the property that mu of M is the cardinality. don't have to distinguish different cardinalities. You can do that, but it's not interesting for our purpose. Right? So, uh, so if M is a finite set, this is just the number of elements in M. So the measure of any point here is one, because it contains one element. Right? Um, and then the then mu of F is simply the sum over X of F. So counting measures uh, is, is exactly what you, how you turn sums into integrals, or how, how you see sums as special cases of integrals. They are integrals with respect to counting measure. Okay? Now this is actually the solution of a problem that von Neumann found in 26. The physicists were talking about continuous uh, quantities like position and momentum, and also about discrete things, very typical of quantum mechanics, like um, energy of an oscillator or angular momentum and stuff. So, so you had a mixture of continuous and discrete quantities. And there's one attempt to make, a, make sense out of that in a formalism by Dirac, which is sort of a further extension of this, this Ket-Bra formalism, where you have improper Kets, like eigenkets of position. Who, who had improper cats in their quantum mechanics lecture? Not if you've had it from me, but uh, <laughs> it's, it, it's actually a bit difficult to, uh, to work with that confidently because what you should do is introduce distributions and, and do that. But, but uh, so this was, this was uh, Dirac's solution and at the time this was black magic because uh, you really would never know how to use this with confidence. That is, what, what were you actually allowed to do and what, what were you not allowed to do? For example, the scalar product of two improper cats is a wild thing. It doesn't, have a, doesn't necessarily have any meaning by itself, only when you stick it in an integral. Right? You have this, this kind of restrictions. So, von Neumann was actually poking fun at Dirac and said, well, okay, you, this is not mathematics, right? and you, you, you don't really know what you're writing there. Von Neumann had his own solution for this problem, for this duality of continuous and discrete quantities, which is this, right? Say that in measure theory, you have both these continuous measures and you have counting measure-like things, so sums, and in this formalism, sums and, and integrals are already in the same formalism. So if you think of your abstract Hilbert space, one in different ways, um, so abstractly, uh, an L2 space over, this, over a continuous set, like the unit interval, is, as an abstract Hilbert space, is, has countably infinite dimension, and uh, uh, these spaces here are, I should say that, that uh, L2 of x and mu count right, is usually abbreviated to uh, L2 of x, little L2. Right? That's the same thing. 
So, um, so this, this naturally contains the two, these two aspects. And especially with regard to the spectral theorem. Now let me write the spectral theorem. Uh, for that I have to explain what a diagonal operator is. Now a diagonal matrix is easy. Right? A diagonal matrix is one in which these matrix elements well with, with they are only non-zero when mu is equal to mu. Right? So they're only on the diagonal of this matrix you have non-zero elements, the rest is zero. Now if you express this in terms of this counting measure space, then that just means that the operator multiplies the component of the vector with some number, which is this diagonal matrix element, times what, uh, with the place where you're looking at it, which would be this new. Right? So this is a multiplication operator. And the same you can say in the continuous case, so the multiplication operator is an operator of the form that a psi of x is some number that depends on x times psi of x. Now this you can write as soon as you have written your, this is only possible in such a concrete Hilbert space. Right? If you know that this is a space of functions, then you can write something like that. And if you do this in the discrete case, in the counting measure case, you exactly, what is a, you exactly get um, a diagonal matrix. Do it as an exercise. And um, so, so this is the, the generalization, or if you, if you wish, for Norman's generalization of a diagonal operator. And then an operator is diagonalizable if it can be transformed by a unitary operation to a multiplication operator. And the spectral theorem of course the spectral theorem is by Norman in the general unbounded case at least. Uh, so it says that if uh, A1 to AK are, if, uh, are commuting, and let's say I throw in the adjoint would measure. So the whole set of operators of the A's and the A stars are commuting operators. So one operator that commutes with its adjoint, of course this is part of the condition here, is called a normal operator. I'll come back to that. Um, and so these, are, these must be normal operators. I could also say they are commuting normal operators. Uh, they and jointly be transformed <coughs> to multiplication operators, that is diagonalized. Okay, we'll look at, uh, so I, time is exactly over, so we'll leave it here for today. And continue on, I erased it, um, Wednesday at 4, right? Which is like Wednesday. <laughs> um, so, so, so this week we'll have three lectures, uh, if that's okay with you, because there will be occasions for dropping one uh, somewhere on the way. So uh, if we have a good start, we are, we are, I think this is a good idea to get past these basically preliminaries, um, and to get into the interesting stuff. Um, so let, let's do a lecture at, at, on Wednesday and on Thursday. And so thank you for your attention, and see you there.